On this Saturday night, help arrives for flood-stricken B.C. The military muscle needed for this emergency, plus the damage revealed as water recedes. Fueled by anxiety. It's absolutely ridiculous. The growing panic at the pumps. Plus the new vaccine mandate for cross-border truckers. And the protest over a pandemic lockdown spirals out of control. Global National with Robin Gill. Good evening and thank you for joining us. We have a devastating development out of British Columbia tonight. The death toll from the catastrophic flooding and landslides has now risen to four. The RCMP says the bodies of three men have been recovered from a slide on Highway 99 near Lillooette. That's about three and a half hours northeast of Vancouver. Global News has learned one of the victims is 35-year-old Mursad Hadzik. His wife also died in the slide. Her body was recovered on Monday. They leave behind a two-year-old girl. Officials say a fifth man is still missing, but search efforts have been suspended because of poor conditions. In southern BC, the situation in Abbotsford remains in flux. Many portions of the Sumas Prairie remain underwater. To give you some context, this is what a major roadway looked like in the city in June of this year. And this is what the same area looked like on Friday. The region is home to some of the most fertile farmland in the country, but much of it remains flooded. This afternoon, the city provided an update on the situation, and there's some positive news. Our Mike Armstrong is in Abbotsford tonight with the very latest. Mike? Well, Robin, there was some good news here today. The city of Abbotsford says it was able to partially open floodgates this morning. Uh, that releases some water from the Sumas to the Fraser Rivers. Uh, that takes some pressure off of the dike. The hope is that levels here continue to go down so that they can open those floodgates even further and then leave them that way. But basically, for the people we've met here today, any good news is welcome. This was supposed to be a dream home built just two years ago. Well, over the last few days, it's been more of a nightmare. The water got so high Monday, seven members of the family had to be rescued by helicopter. That included Herjit Preywal's 96-year-old grandfather. This was something, he says, that was unimaginable. I thought there was no way the water was going to get to the house. We built the house three feet higher than the road over there. And you thought the road was high? Yeah, I thought the road was high. Now, you get a feeling for the scale of this disaster from up high. Acre after acre flooded, businesses, farms, homes, hundreds affected. From below, you get an idea of how the water is receding. It's gone down, so I, I would guess, five or six feet. Right here. We met Jerry Ebers out for a walk with his grandson, surveying the situation. There are still cars and trucks that were caught in the flooding and abandoned. Every morning I wake up and I look out my windows and I look over the field and see how much green grass I can see. The Abbotsford Fire Department shared photos Saturday of crews working to repair a breach in the dike, saying there is progress being made. But for people who've been out of their homes, things are dragging on. About 60 evacuees are staying at this convention center. We got here Monday, I think. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Are we Saturday? Yep. Okay. Alberta Blockland's home was flooded, but only the basement. She's not sure when she'll be able to go back, even just to check on things. No one can tell her, but she says it might be soon. It's getting to a point where I'm like, I'm just moving back in. But then we were told that there's a fine, $2,000 fine per person if they catch you. So, and I don't even know if that's true. I mean, this is all rumor, all rumor. Now, the reason things have improved is because the rain has stopped. The problem is the rain is coming back. The forecast calls for uh, rain starting Monday for days, and on some of those days, a lot. That is exactly the news people here don't want to hear. Robin. Mike Armstrong in Abbotsford, B.C. Thanks, Mike. Major roads and highways were taken out by the floods and mudslides, so no trucks can get in and out. That's led to supply issues, and to address that, the province has limited fuel purchases to 30 litres at a time. But the conservation measure is fueling a new problem. Global's Paul Johnson joins us now from Vancouver with the latest on the rationing. Paul? Hey, Robin. This is a Petrocan in the west side of Vancouver. Normally, this is a pretty quiet gas station, but as you can see, today, they're slammed. 
the kind of long lineups they don't typically see here. We've been talking to drivers throughout the Lower Mainland, and most of them tell us they get it. This is an extraordinary situation, and they're going to follow the rules. But, of course, what appears to be happening is the psychology of scarcity itself. Pretty much from the moment B.C. made this announcement Friday, we saw lineups starting at gas stations throughout the Lower Mainland. So we're now faced with the possibility that the most immediate threat to the gasoline supply here may not be the delivery problem, but on the demand side with people doing panic buying. Here's B.C.'s public safety minister, Mike Farnworth. If you can avoid travel, work from home, or take public transit for the next 10 days, you will help ensure that we have the fuel and access and means to keep responding as we need to. As soon as you start telling people to stop buying gas, they're going to start panic buying, making it a lot worse. And now all of a sudden, there's going to be absolutely nothing. It's going to be there, same as all the food's going to be in the stores. And it's embarrassing to see people hoarding everything, and especially in this time when, you know. So just to recap what the situation is for drivers here in this part of British Columbia, right now limited to 30 litres per fill-up. This is an honor system. We don't have the police out at gas stations. Commercial and emergency vehicles, of course, are exempt. They hope that this will be normalized and they can drop this by December 1st. But of course, some of the big unknowns, how do they restore the fuel supply infrastructure? The single biggest component that we've lost is the Trans Mountain Pipeline, which delivers oil from Alberta. They're expecting they may get that up and running by the end of next week. But already, they're pointing out this is the longest shutdown in that pipeline in its 70-year history. Robin? Paul Johnson in Vancouver. Thanks, Paul. To help ease the gas shortage, the B.C. government is calling on Ottawa to change its PCR testing requirements earlier than planned. It's going to be done anyway on the 30th of November, so why not do it now? If approved by the federal government, the move would allow people in the Lower Mainland to cross the border and fill up like pre-COVID times. As of November 30th, fully vaccinated Canadians will be able to go back and forth for short trips without needing a costly PCR test. The federal government says American visitors will still need a PCR test. And there's a new mandate for truckers, considered essential workers who go back and forth over the border they'll have to be vaccinated. As David Aiken reports, this patchwork of rules has irked the travel industry. Every day, 30,000 trucks roll across the Canada-U.S. border, bringing food and supplies crucial to feeding both countries and keeping North America's economy moving. For that reason, truck drivers were deemed essential workers, exempt from public health rules when it comes to travel. But that exemption ends January the 15th, which means truck drivers, like all other travelers, will have to be fully vaccinated. And in an industry already short some 18,000 drivers, Ottawa's vaccine mandate will make things worse. Anywhere between 10 and 20 percent of, of the uh, 120,000 truck drivers, Canadian truck drivers, that cross into the United States and Canada border uh, will exit the industry. Meanwhile, the airline industry is upset Ottawa did not scrap the requirement for molecular tests for all inbound travelers. Only fully vaccinated Canadians out of the country for less than three days will be exempt from that testing requirement. By only focusing on short trips and Canadian travelers, government has taken a piecemeal approach that is not justified nor based on science, the National Airlines Council of Canada said in a statement. To our knowledge, no other country in the world has adopted such a narrow approach. When Parliament resumes next week, the Trudeau government can expect to hear about that from the opposition. Scrapping the PCR test is, uh, is where we need to go. We need to do it for our economy. We need to do it to get in line with, uh, with our allies. I don't have the but some experts think the incremental approach to rule changes for travellers is the right one. I think that this signals what we all hope is one more step towards normalcy. Um, and I think that doing it in a progressive, stepwise manner is the way to go. For now, the government has committed only to a review of the rules in the weeks ahead. David Aiken, Global News, Ottawa. 
The rising number of infections in Europe has led to some governments imposing new restrictions to curb the spread of COVID-19. In the Netherlands, police and protesters faced off overnight as demonstrations against a new partial lockdown turned violent. Rotterdam's mayor called it an orgy of violence as people in the city streets fought with police and torched cars. Authorities used water cannons and fired warning shots to push the crowds back. The new restrictions will be in place for three weeks and see limits put on gatherings in homes and the operation of non-essential businesses. This week, the Dutch government recorded its highest single-day increase of new infections. There were angry demonstrations across the United States last night, a show of outrage over the acquittal of Kyle Rittenhouse. A jury found the 18-year-old not guilty of murdering the two men he shot last year during an anti-racism protest in Kenosha, Wisconsin. As Jennifer Johnson reports, Rittenhouse may have been freed, but he could still face more legal action. Overnight, a small group of protesters remained outside the Kenosha, Wisconsin courthouse, where hours before, 18-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse was acquitted of five charges, including intentional homicide. We, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. In Brooklyn, New York, a much louder crowd denounced the verdict. By allowing Kyle Rittenhouse to walk away, this entire country, this government, has slapped us all in the face. In August 2020, Rittenhouse fatally gunned down two men, Joseph Rosenbaum and Anthony Huber, and wounded a third during a protest in Kenosha over the shooting of a black man, Jacob Blake, by a white police officer. Rittenhouse testified he shot the men in self-defense. The verdict is polarizing parts of the country. He did not come up here to save lives. He came up here to take lives. He said that before he got here, and that's exactly what he did. You know, I feel like they made the right choice. You know, it was, it was simple self-defense. President Biden said the jury's verdict left him angry and concerned, but it must be accepted. But his vice president had a much stronger reaction. The verdict really speaks for itself. As many of you know, I've spent a majority of my career working to make the criminal justice system more equitable and clearly there's a lot more work to do. Rittenhouse's future is now very much in question. He can still face a civil lawsuit by the plaintiff's families where the burden of proof is much easier. There is precedent. In a famous civil lawsuit, the loved ones of Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman were awarded a $33.5 million judgment against O.J. Simpson after he was acquitted of their murders. Even if Rittenhouse doesn't have any money, it could be a moral victory for the families who were shocked by the jury's decision. In this case, it feels like the victims' lives don't matter. In the meantime, Rittenhouse's attorney says the teenager will likely move away from the area, saying it's too dangerous for him to stay there. Jennifer Johnson, Global News, Washington. Coming up, the one-on-one -on -one with the conservative leader, a Global News exclusive. Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole is standing his ground following a threat to his leadership. This week, a senator from his own party launched a petition calling for a review of his election performance. On the West Block, O'Toole speaks exclusively with our Mercedes Stevenson about his future and divisions within his party. Mercedes. Robin, earlier this week in Ottawa, Aaron O'Toole held a caucus retreat where he faced off with MPs and senators who are unhappy with his performance and the centrist direction he's taking the party in. In his first interview with network television since the election, Aaron O'Toole told the West Bloc he is confident that he has the support of caucus, even after Senator Denise Batters publicly attacked O'Toole and O'Toole booted her from caucus. We had the best retreat, best caucus meetings we've had in my full year as leader, Mercedes. We're united on standing up for Canadians when Parliament returns. When someone fights against their own team, doesn't actually follow the will of the team, we have caucus meetings that are, are always lively. They have been since I came here nine years ago as a backbencher, but those conversations are held indoors. We respect one another. And the situation with one of our senators, she made a decision to essentially leave the team herself. Senate Conservatives have defied O'Toole's position, though, and are keeping batters in their caucus. Aaron O'Toole also told the West Bloc that all Conservative MPs are now fully vaccinated or have received medical exemptions, and they will be in the House of Commons when Parliament returns on Monday. 
The news comes after the Conservative leader had promised to challenge a vaccine mandate requiring all MPs to be doubly vaccinated in order to enter the House of Commons. Well, we've said for many months, Mercedes, that we, when we return to Parliament, and that's coming now this week, we will be ready to serve and that all the MPs will be vaccinated or will have a medical exemption following the rules. We'll have more tomorrow on the West Block. Robin. Mercedes Stevenson in Ottawa. Thanks, Mercedes. And as Mercedes mentioned, you can watch the full interview with O'Toole tomorrow on the West Block right here on Global. A senator from Ontario has passed away after being treated for COVID-19. José Forré Niling was admitted to a Sudbury hospital in October, but was discharged last week to recover at home. She was fully vaccinated, though she had an autoimmune condition affecting her lungs, making her particularly vulnerable to the virus. Forré Niling had been a member of the independent Senate group since 2018. She was 56. Still ahead, a country that broke away from the former Yugoslavia now threatened with its own breakup. There are mounting concerns about peace and stability in Bosnia and Herzegovina. The Balkan nation's long-standing power-sharing deal is at risk of crumbling. It was put in place 26 years ago to end the brutal ethnic war that claimed tens of thousands of lives. As Redmond Shannon explains, the leader of the country's Serbian region has threatened to split up key institutions, including the army. 78-year-old Haira Chatic died this month after spending a quarter of a century looking for her murdered son, Nihad. She never found him. He was among more than 8,000 Muslim men and boys killed in the Srebrenica genocide carried out by the Bosnian Serb army during the Bosnian War in the 90s. Now there are fears such ethnic tensions could break this fragile young nation apart. As part of the 1995 Dayton Accord, Bosnia and Herzegovina is made up of a loose union of two regions. The Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is mostly Bosniak Muslims and ethnic Croats, and the Republika Srpska, which is mostly ethnic Serbs. The country's presidency rotates between the three groups. Uh, the Serbian leader Milorad Dodik has recently threatened to pull out of state institutions, including potentially splitting the army in two. His rhetoric leaves the scars and people are already scared, uh, uh, especially those who are old enough to remember the 90s. We all feel re-traumatized. Nejma Jananovic uh, says large-scale violence is unlikely, but people in ethnic enclaves are feeling under threat. Dodik claims that everything he does uh, is uh, an act of retaliation uh, to the former high representative of the international community. Valentin Insko, who recently left the role, used the job's power to make genocide denial a crime. The high representative was placed in Bosnia as part of of the peace deal. They're appointed by the West, something Russia, an ally of Serbia and Serbs, is unhappy with. Weg vom weit. The incumbent Christian Schmidt says Dodik's moves are part of a slow erosion of the Dayton Accord. Kurt Bessiner is a former advisor to the representative's office. We have more tools to deal with this kind of challenge in Bosnia than we do anywhere else on earth. And yet we're still on the back foot. So that signifies a real policy humiliation and failure. Dodik says threats of U.S. sanctions don't scare him, likely betting the West has bigger problems to deal with. Adding to the tensions are efforts by Croat nationalists to reform the electoral system, potential changes that could edge out more moderate parties in the small but diverse country. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Up next, high inflation and low interest rates, the consequences for consumers. Life is getting more expensive, and we know you already know that. Well, Statistics Canada is validating your concerns. The latest inflation snapshot for October reveals the cost of living is up 4.7% in the past year, and interest rates are low. As Anne Gaviola reports, that combination is not good for your bank account. Isn't anyone trying? 
The last time inflation was this hot was back in February 2003 when Avril Lavigne topped the charts. Now, a big driver of the cost of living this time around was gas. Prices at the pumps up more than 40% since October 2020. But that's not all. Just about everything is more expensive. Food, shelter, cars. Current combination of high inflation and low interest rates is a double whammy for household budgets. High inflation eats away at your purchasing power while your money hardly earns anything in your savings account. Now with stock markets, including the TSX, regularly breaking records and the cryptocurrency market making headlines for crossing new heights, you may be tempted to redirect your cash. The historical pace of inflation for the past century is about 3% annually. Now with the TSX returning 9.3% between 1960 and 2020, that's one way to guard against inflation. But personal finance expert Bridget Casey says not to dip into your emergency fund, even if it's barely earning any interest in your savings account. Anything that's a short-term goal, so less than two years, should absolutely be totally in cash. Instead, shop around to find a higher interest, no fee savings account from an online only bank or a credit union, but leave your rainy day fund alone. The Bank of Canada has signaled it could raise its key lending rates as early as this spring or summer, but portfolio manager Ben Felix says this isn't the time to be totally revamping your investment mix. We don't know where inflation is going to go, but as of now, I wouldn't I wouldn't be rushing to increase risk in a portfolio to to combat um, higher unexpected inflation because we we can't expect that. I think we have to wait and see what happens. Some view cryptocurrency as a hedge against inflation, but Felix doesn't buy it. The reality is that crypto is extremely volatile, and something that volatile, it's really tricky to call it a hedge. The same thing is true with gold. Financial experts recommend taking a good hard look at your bank and investment fees. Those can be reduced. Sometimes it's just a matter of a simple phone call to negotiate. That's probably one of the best things that you can do for your finances in the meantime. Anne Gaviola, Global News, Toronto. And that is Global National for this Saturday night. I'm Robin Gill. Tonight, your Canada is the view from Hudson Bay Mountain above Smithers, British Columbia. We'd love to see your corner of the country, so please keep sending your photos to viewers at globalnational.com. Thank you for watching. Jeff Semple will be at the anchor desk tomorrow. Have a great night.